Yeah, we can start with that. Chain, <laughs> <laughs> you're lint free. Am I lint free? Oh, good. Because I, I was just realizing that I, uh, I had just held a pug a moment ago. Um, hi, everybody! Welcome to episode <laughs> five. That's one, two, three, four, five. Count them uh, of the uh, Crafty Boys. Uh, haven't posted the last one because I just got too busy and people were dying. Lamer. So, um, so this week uh, we're back uh, because we always are. You never know when we're going to disappear. So just love us anyway. Um, of course, uh, my name is Shane, and we of course also have gesturing in Dave's direction. Oh, <laughs> we're both down in the corner, so that's both of us. But yes, Dave and and, and Alan. Hi. <laughs> well, welcome. You are. Welcome. Welcome to our. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to our podcast. It's it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Enjoy the show. So good to see everybody. So how's your week been, boys? Has it been uh, as exciting as it should have been? Not even by half. No. Well, Dave, you had something exciting happen, man. You gotta share. You gotta share. Did with I? The what? What was it? What is it? I don't do exciting. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we talked not oh, not but I, two days ago, and you were like, I totally got something really exciting to share with you, and so you did. And but what is it? You can now share with everybody else. I. You'll have to refresh my forgettery. Just give me a clue. What? You don't okay. remember? You know that thing? No. That thing you got? The thing? The, thing. the, the, oh. the thing? Oh, my God. Wow. You don't, you don't mean this, do you? There we go. Oh, nice. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. You got I that thing clarify. Like only a little while ago, and, I, and I, you were showing it to me. It was all exciting. And two days <laughs> later, you're like, nothing exciting ever happens. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> yes, okay. Yes. But I, I should qualify. This, um, I, I would very much like it to just be mine, but it's rental, just to clarify. I know, but, but it's still it exciting. It's pretty. Look at it. It looks like the See? guitar from Back to the Future. Uh no, totally. No 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 no, that was it was white. Was it white? Oh, I, I'm pretty sure. You mean Marvin Berry's? Yeah. It was white. If I remember right, it was oh, what's known as a Stratocaster. Well, what's what's the Wayne's World one? The Stratocaster 9000 yeah. or something? Uh. No, it was just a Stratocaster. So, uh, what is our beer this week, Alan? Our beer this week is uh, the Phillips uh, Brewery Longboat, which is a chocolate porter. Ah. Uh -huh. And it looks uh -huh. so pretty. So it's a porter, and it tastes like chocolate. And this means that I am now going to, as I usually do, pop this baby open. What so, Alan, was yours that? still sealed? Or not? What? Yeah, mine was still sealed. No. Oh. So I never popped it. That's actually a good question. Um, if you open a beer, uh, what do you do after? If you don't drink the whole thing at once, which is a crime. Yes. But if you have to only have a little bit of it, and you have some left over, like I've got this little bit here, and I might save some for later. Um, what are you doing, Dave? You actually had some. You were showing us earlier that you. Uh, Reminded me of your foreskin. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's late at night. My brain is already oh, you know, a long day. Okay, this is just going from low to lower. But anyways, this, dear viewers, all all one of you, this is what <laughs> you can use. It's a cork-ish thing. It's just rubber, and you need to buy a pump that goes with this, and you pump to get the air out of the bottle. 
<laughs> I am not going to laugh. It, not going to laugh. In not gonna theory, laugh. Not gonna laugh. it depressurizes the bottle, and you get a nice head back on things. But I'm trying to get more head, and it's not working. Oh, there we go. I there got a 1976 go. number for you if you... I get... <laughs> there, got some head. Well Here's... played, sir, well played. <laughs> so, um... And look at the color of that head. Is that not purdy? That's pretty gorgeous, actually. Mine actually didn't come up very well. Like, I don't... I don't. I mean, I have a little bit, not a whole lot. Well, bit. the head's mostly gone on mine. Um... You didn't pump vigorously enough, Shane. <laughs> At least not on the beer. Sorry, I was I was distracted by the pug. I I can't answer. That. <laughs> um, so, so um, yeah, I mean it's kind of cool because I mean very rarely does does the beer in this home kind of you know do that. But however, we do buy the odd growler, and most growlers from uh, and if you don't know what a growler is, it's like a big bottle like this, or or the small uh, two liter ones, I think, yeah. or like that, uh, which apparently are called meowlers. Um, so if you have uh, these, they recommend drinking them within like three days or four days, roughly on average. Um, but you can actually get like the caps that that actually do seal much like what you what you got there, Dave. Because oh, I mean really? these bottles, these bottles are actually. I mean these are more like wine bottles, so they tend to fit. You know, if you buy something from a wine store, uh, they tend to work anyway. But um, although this Phillips bottle, eh, I guess it would work. But, well, uh, but yeah, it, it gets up for growlers, perfect. too. Mm, true, true. So, um, so that's actually really good. Uh, a, a good safety tip for all you beer drinkers out there is uh, if you have a growler, a meowler, or a bottle of beer you just didn't finish and you want to save it, and it's not just a stubby, because a stubby, would just, that would just be weird, um, you, can have, you can get like a, a little suction thingy that pumps rubber and... That just came out so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean that's that's not a, that's not a hurt. Uh, to, <laughs> I've had a really long day. I, uh, I've had so um our topic this this the see I'm telling you I'm just forget it. Uh, our topic this week is uh, what Dave you actually had a really good idea or sorry was it Alan was it your idea? <laughs> no, I didn't have any idea. Oh man! Uh, so uh -oh. go ahead, Dave. Do you pick out the what topic? What the hell? Dave? Is this a Dave show all of a sudden? It is the Dave uh, show. Welcome. I I can't think of <laughs> anything off the top of my head. Fuck. Uh, all right. All right. All right. I do, right, 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 right. I do have some things. Okay. Uh, that I thought maybe we could talk about. Um. Uh. uh stuff. Um, that's Our, how awesome. about classic video games? Uh, well, <clears throat> funny you should mention that. Um, the other day, uh, and then I, I saw it again posted today on Facebook, uh, a video of video game deaths. And what that means is essentially uh, this this dude who works at uh, one of those sort of the video game reviewing website YouTube things. Um, Put together like a, 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 a about a three or four minute video of deaths from video games, and basically, you know, it started at uh, at uh, uh, not I want to say Pong, it wasn't Pong? Um, yeah, no, I guess it was Pong, where you know the ball went off the screen, and that was your death. And then it had um, other video games after that, sort of starting at sort of asteroids and and uh, and those sorts of things, all the way up until. A couple sort of games from the last few years. Question. And, yes. Can you actually say that the ball going off the frickin' screen for Pong is a death? Yeah, in a way. Yeah, I think so. I think I so. Mean, basically, anything that stops play for for the the player. Um, you lose so a there was point. a bunch of things. There was like Ghosts and Goblins. There was uh, what was that game? Uh, Wizard needs food badly. What was that game? A Gauntlet. I just answered my own question. Um, but it was kind of cool because there were actually a lot of games in there that I had forgotten that I'd ever played, um, and it was kind of interesting that that 
video games have been around for so long now. I mean, they've been around for longer than we've been alive, really, because the first video game was roughly mid-60s, I gather, um, which was like a war game on one of those big machines that, you know, fits in your house kind of idea, um, or is bigger than your house at that time. But what is your favorite video game of all time? I mean, that's really sort of the question, I think, to start it off, because the death video was from way back when Atari 2600 through to, you know, computer games from from not too long ago on the PCs, but I don't know. What is your... If you think of video games, a video game you might want to play forever, no matter how old it gets, what would it be? Emperor. Emperor. Which is actually relatively recent in in game life terms. Okay. Now, um, what is it? Describe it to us. What is the point uh, of Emperor? Well, you boys probably remember Rome... Okay. I'm guessing. City um, Builder. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've, I've never really played Rome. Um, Alan, you're shrugging your shoulders. Yeah. Um, like, are we talking about it came out, like, is this like a computer game, or is this like an arcade? No, this year? is actually computer, like PC. Uh, uh, okay. Rome was, Rome uh, was a I may not be... Food. That's probably not your kind of game. Was it Emperor mm. Rise of the Middle Kingdom? Indeed, yes, it is, sir. Uh, this and I love that game. Rise of the Little Kingdom is the sixth title in a city-building series by Breakaway Games. Um, was contracted for Emperor, and it was uh, this particular game maker had also worked on Queen of the Nile. Um, but essentially, it is a game. It's basically like a turn-based kind of building game, and you are uh, similar to like Sim City, I gather. Um, and also, it came out in 2002, and mm. it was, of course, a Windows-based uh, game. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, just Microsoft Windows. So Let's go back a few years. So what about what about you, Alan? What's what sort of your knee-jerk? Well, I mean, it's it's hard. There's so many of them, right? Um, if I think about arcade games, of course, my favorite is the Star Wars Vector game. Uh, from, uh, I don't know, I guess it came out in like 82 or 83, but that was the one, you know, where you've got, uh, you do the trench run over and over and over again, and it just get, keeps getting harder every single time, and all the shapes are just these green line vectors. And it was the first game, it was the first game to have digitized sound, and they had a, a they had one up at the 7-Eleven just up from my place here, and uh, up on Cary Road in Tillicum. And uh, I used to go up there all the time. I pumped so many quarters into that thing. <laughs> I should probably own it. I, I, I put so much money into it. And then, of I course... You know, so too. <laughs> that was my favorite part. Um, that Yahoo! game, by the way, the game you just mentioned is um, from 1983. It was released in May of 1983 as uh, two versions it had the stand-up typical arcade box mm -hmm. as well as the sit-down, you know, you're in the cockpit kind of thing. Yeah. Um, actually, I love that game too. and that's, that's, that's a really good one. Um, there was one very similar around the same time, but it was a little bit later, like 85, 86, um, which was Star Trek. And oh. uh, you had a control stick and a, and a turning, you had a turning wheel, like a knob uh, on one side where you actually turned... Uh, the uh, the vessel from side to side and whatnot. One moment. This is the best podcast ever. Hello, Locke. How are you? Are you at <laughs> home? Are you in front of a computer? I sent you an invite to our podcast, but uh, I didn't hear from you, so I called you instead. Shane Check. is talking on the phone, everybody. Um we will. Dave and I will continue talking while he's on the yep, phone. We are uh, we are ten Indeed. minutes into it, and I'm talking on the phone and recording this at the same time. <laughs> blah blah. So if you get back to your place and you yeah. check your email, you'll see the invite. What about Battlefield 1942, Dave? You ever play that? Uh, unfortunately, no. No. 
No. That was a really good game. I mean, I could play that one over and over again. Well, what what's it in now? Like it's 500th iteration or something? Yeah, I mean, it's more it's console-based now. Um, yeah. But the original, 1942, um, the online play was incredible. No, I don't know yeah. how many maps there were, like 25 maps or something, and you just... It was just so much wow. fun. I think I still, the, I still play it now. Oh really? Yeah, I'm I actually do. excited for Battlefront, Battlefront Three, because that was really the only thing I liked about um, 1942 was the fact that they had that mod. Remember the mod you and I played? Galactic uh, Conquest. Oh, is that what it was called? God. Uh, oh my God! Uh, Galactic oh, Conquest. oh 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 oh! I've re-downloaded it and installed it, and I play it now with uh, uh, on a LAN. Here, me and me and the kids, we play it on the land. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, actually. Yeah. Wow. It's fun. Anyway, yeah, Battlefield Three. I'm totally looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's... or Battlefront Three. Sorry. B- yeah, Battlefront. Actually, what is it called? Isn't it called? Yeah, it's called Battle. I think it's just called Battlefront. I don't, I don't think they're actually putting a name no. on the end of it. It's been so long, right? Um, I yeah, that was 1942 was one of the better games out there at the time because it was, um. Just that whole being able to have that whole Star Wars environment that was done in a decent way, like it just didn't, it didn't suck. Yeah. Like uh, the who the people that put it together really worked on it really hard. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So you were talking about your Star Trek game. Oh yeah, so the Star Trek game, yeah, is uh, it was it had this knob and you sat down, very similar to the Star Wars one, and uh, you had uh, phasers, you had uh, photon torpedoes that you could fire off, and you. And the main screen was you looking sort of on this horizontal plane that had stars flying by and that kind of thing. And um, and then you had a little a smaller map that actually showed you where the Klingons were, because that was the whole point. You had to shoot the Klingons, and there was really not much else to the game other than blow them up. Um, but of course, and they twiddling your knob. And twiddling the knob. But, uh, playing with your knob. When you're playing with your knob, it's a, it's, it's a good experience when you're for all kids. <laughs> um, anyway, the... Um, the other component uh, of that game was that uh, it again had the the vector look. It looked exactly like Star Wars, mm. uh, so it wasn't, you know, that different. Um, the uh, I played it the, actually when I was introduced to it uh, was back in 1986 when my parents uh, they bought um, those membership cards for Expo '86. And if you bought them, I think they bought them in like 84, 85, like late 84, beginning of 85. Um, because if you bought these cards, they were like a laminated thing with your picture on it. And you got a significant discount to actually go to Expo. And you, and you were able to go um, the entire run of the, of the event, which Expo ran from, I want to say like February to October or something. Or was it, it might have been a bit later. Does anybody remember that? I don't even remember now. I remember going, but no, I don't remember how it's run. Um, so the uh, I'm just gonna look it up because I I spent a lot of time in Vancouver at the time. Uh, it ran from uh, May to October. That's right, May to October. So it was a bit later. Um, but yeah, the uh, when we when we went for the first time uh, during or sorry we, sorry we went a lot. I was there for weeks at a time kind of thing because it was an event. But uh, we stayed at a campground out in Surrey, deep dark Surrey somewhere, and uh, took the Sky Train into. I uh, took a bus to the Sky Train and took the Sky Train to the to the event, and uh, that was a big deal because the Sky Train was relatively new. And so anyway, um, at this campground, they had an arcade that you could use for free. Uh, so for people that were going to Expo, I guess it was an attractive thing. Uh, so yeah, so I played that game way more than I probably should have. <laughs> wow. But um but I think hands down my favorite game of all time uh actually I have two uh because I I when I think of video games I always think wouldn't it be great to actually have this game again. Um but probably of the two the top one is Scorched Earth. Oh. Uh ton of dirt. A very basic game but it was so fun to play with people. And the interesting thing is that the majority of the time, uh, 
when you were playing with people, unless you had a local land like you're talking about about the 1942 game, um, you could actually play with people online as well. But it was better to play with people in the room. And I did that quite a bit. Actually, Alan and I have done it before uh, many, many times. Um, there, I played, I think, did they have a birthday party or something? I seem to have had a birthday party and we had really bad pizza. But uh, yeah, but I remember, I remember playing that. Scorched Earth for, we played for hours, like late into the night kind of thing. And, so, okay, uh, what's the deal with this game? Because I've never played it. Well, Scorched Earth is a game where it's it's a tank game. So think of um, any tank game you've ever played in the '80s or early '90s. Um, I can think where of it's a couple. Basically, a screen that has some sort of a uh, vector environment, mountains and whatnot, and then it mm -hmm. randomly places your tanks. Uh, and then you get a so every it's a turn-based thing. So when you get a turn, uh, you select the amount of power you want to shoot with the angle that you're shooting at. Um, but the interesting thing about Scorched Earth is you had these options. Every time you killed somebody or every time you, you survived a round or different sort of events, uh, you got money. So you could use this money to buy uh, shields. You could use them to buy weapons. Um, my favorite, of course, was buying parachutes. So when somebody shot the ground out from underneath your tank and your tank started to fall, the parachute would deploy and you would not die. Um, so yeah, I mean, there was things like you could shoot lava bombs. So you could like shoot a a, 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 a weapon, and when it hit the ground, it would turn into a lake of lava kind of thing and, and flow over the environment um, onto people. Hopefully, uh, you had um, things that would dig up the ground to make people fall. Uh, you had nuclear uh, weaponry. You had funky uh, bombs. The funky bombs. You had like these sort of Merv things that it would you know, launch into the sky and then it would burst into multiple warheads. Or you had the funky bomb, which was like this. It would hit the ground and then it would make this weird noise. And it would blast, you know, kind of like a Merv, it would blast away more stuff. Um, my favorite, of course, which is the one that we all, if we could afford it, because it was a, the most expensive weapon in the game, uh, was the Death's Head. So um, if you played the game... Now, here's the best part. This is the kind of the cool part of the game. Uh, you can actually tell the game uh, whether or not you wanted the borders of your screen, so the rectangle of the monitor, to ricochet the bullets you shoot, or if you wanted them to just pass through and kind of loop back and sort of until they came down. So I remember many times shooting off the death's head and just, you know, cranking, you know, doing a 45-degree angle, full power, shooting this thing. And the death's head, what it did is it acted like a Merv. It would break apart into multiple warheads, but the explosion radius on the warheads was really large. And I think every time we shot this thing, I think rarely did people survive. Uh, so basically, even, even the shooter. Yeah, it would clear the board. It would kill everybody, <laughs> including yourself. And uh, it was kind of fun because if you, if you got it right, if you angled it right, and if you were at a right, a really high up on the screen, up on a mountain or whatever, and you shot this thing really, really far... Um, it would take, you know, a good 30 seconds for the fucker to come down. Like, it would just come down and then just annihilate everybody, but you would actually watch the little markers on the side of the screen telling you where all the warheads were. And uh, so you kind of were like, oh, please, oh, please, don't hit me. I don't know. If I survive, I can. St I still have this. Because the thing is, if you got hit and took damage, um, you couldn't shoot as far. You didn't have as much power to the to the shots you were making. Um but with the it death head, have... it didn't matter. It would take well, out like, yeah, all the landscape. Well, yeah, 99% of the time it didn't matter anyway. So it was kind of, I don't know. It was a very basic game, but it was one of the games that I remember as being one of the most sort of communal, and it was fun to hang out with people and actually play it uh, without having to rely on... I mean, if you ever watch YouTube videos of people playing, uh, you know, any of these sort of first-person shooters, you know, Call of Duty or whatever, um, it's interesting because... A whole bunch of the videos are very young people screaming shit at people, at other players. You know, I'm going to hump your mom, and, you know, I'm going to do your sister, or I'm going to, you know, you're a bitch, or whatever. And it's fun to watch those once in a while, but at the same time, you kind of go, what happened to gameplay? What happened to actually having fun at these games and not trying to prove... Like, for some reason, the people seem to think these games, you know, prove something about their manliness or whatever. Um... Didn't Will so, yeah. Wheaton have something to say about this? <clears throat> Sorry? Didn't Will Wheaton have something to say about this? 
He did. He did. Actually, I believe it's games, Wheaton's first law. It is. Don't be a dick. Um, <laughs> which reminds me, a complete sidebar. Uh, Will Wheaton posted on his blog a couple days ago that he is going to be the main voice of the uh, Firefly video online video game. So the player that you play, if you choose to be a male, will be his voice doing the dialogue. Oh, wow. So that's kind of cool. So cool. apparently he's a couple weeks he's going to record the, his stuff. and Sweet. Right on. Anyway, completely. So I don't know. So that's kind of my video game story about that. I mean, I like to play video games. I've played many, many, many games. But I do... I mean, that's actually the only video game I've gone back and tried. I mean, remember we installed on your machine, Alan, last Christmas or the Christmas before... Um, just so we could play it again. And yeah. there is actually a 3D ad- version of it. Somebody actually took a, a, a rendering engine and made a 3D version of the mm-hmm. game, so you could actually drive around a small landscape and, and sort of have that, that... I think you and I played it once, if I remember correctly, but I, I don't recall. Yeah, actually, I, I seem to remember that, but, I, th- you know, the 2D one was so much better. Oh, I agree, I agree, because there's nothing about... There's something about nostalgia that that uh, men really get behind, you know, be it cars, video games, old girlfriends, old boyfriends, um, you know, or whatever it might be, right? So, I don't know, I, I just, why do you got, why do you think that we actually like these games? Like, what is it? I like the camaraderie, but uh, what else? Well, for, for me, it is the social aspect, you know, getting together with people and, and playing, which is, maybe I'll mention another game, at uh, you know like if you're at a uh, at an arcade or something you could play with three people doing this one game and that was Rampage you know oh, you could, yeah Rampage Rampage was great because while all other games wanted you to create something or save somebody or do something constructive this thing was uh you know you're either Godzilla or King Kong or some weird wolfman guy, and all you do is just destroy. You you tear down the city, you eat the armies, um, and, and you can have three people playing at once, each one with a different character, and you go up and you climb buildings and you punch them, and, and you you know, you know go down, and as you're going down, you you're continue punching until the building comes down. You eat the blonde lady with the low-cut dress, and you... And then the helicopters come in, you punch them, and <laughs> that was great. I loved that game. That's right. I never really got into that game because I never actually had a platform to play it on. And I, around that, I mean, I guess I played, what arcade did you attend in uh, in Victoria growing up? Oh, Johnny Z's. And that, what, there was, it always had the single location downtown, or no, there was, there was other locations. There was a there. second one at University Heights. Oh yeah, it didn't, it didn't really last all that long. Because I I know that the video game place I used to go to when I was really young um, was it was on Shelbourne at uh, I want to say like Shelbourne and Cedar Hill Crossroad that kind of thing. Oh okay, yeah, I, I was um, probably there at some point. I've forgotten. It was it was sort You're of talking about the plaza. No, it was it was across the street from that that mall that's right down there. Um, I can't remember. Really, I I could I could probably find the building again, but um, yeah, it was it was not like the best of buildings. It was basically like a warehouse kind of thing. Um, you know, there was a big huge front door. You walked in that way, or you could actually go in the back as well. But um, I remember actually <laughs> the I guess the owner of the place uh, asked where I was from, and I said I'd come from Sanichton. Which I didn't actually grow up in Sanishton, but it was the first thing out of my mouth, and I remember thinking after I said I said it that no, no, that's actually not where you live, Shane. That Sanishton is way farther up the peninsula, and but the person was like so overjoyed that I had traveled so far to come to his little arcade. <laughs> he gave me like five dollars and quarters, and I was like, oh. Did you travel in like a chuck wagon? And <laughs> apparently, yeah, I mean, <laughs> made, made like a three-day Although... trek. Although I do remember reading a, a, an old uh, time, not a Times colonist, but the the colonist, I think it was, um, from eighteen something, uh, where it was actually to get from Victoria oh, yeah. to uh, to what Sydney was at the time, which actually I think it had a different name at the time, 
um, was an overnight trip because you got to like the crossroad or uh, one of those areas and it was you stayed at a hotel there and then you went on and you got to the because it was you know horses and that was about it well you know it, it's interesting when I was a kid I had a paper route and um, one of the houses on my route had uh, collected old cars and one of them was a, like an old delivery truck and it actually said in bold letters the, the name of the delivery company which I don't remember and then it said Victoria to Sydney, and then in italics, overnight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like this is some amazing thing. I mean, you can go from Victoria to Sydney now in about what twenty minutes, fifteen minutes, if you're if you like push the speed limits a little bit. But overnight, oh my God, stop the presses! <laughs> it can go over. I'm gonna spend my money. That's amazing! And here we have people bitching that they can't get their Amazon order, you know. Why can't I get this in two days? Ah, it's going to take a week and a half. It's like, oh, shut up. <laughs> We're all spoiled now. This is the problem with this kind of stuff. We're spoiled. We have to get mm. from point A to point B in 20 minutes. And it's like that um, uh, Louis C.K. thing where I think he was on Letterman or something. And, uh, or The Tonight Show. And he uh, was talking about how he was on a plane, and some guy on the uh, like nearby uh, was talking about how he couldn't get on the Wi-Fi uh, in the plane. And then, after his frustration got the better of him, he slammed his laptop shut and said, "Oh, this is bullshit." And it was kind of amusing because he he did point out something that I kind of think about once in a while, where it's absolute magic that sitting in a plane on your laptop and getting a connection to the internet is quite hard to do. And it's, it's, is magic because you are sitting in this device, you're sitting at your device that's connected to another device that's connected to yet another device. Who's most likely talking to a satellite somewhere that's bringing down this information and, and taking your information and bringing it down back to earth. There's a lot of technology involved and, and to sit there and kind of go, this is bullshit. Rah! Uh, is crap because I did it last year ha! Um, at uh, at Disneyland. I uh, I was using a, a provider called Roam Mobility to connect to the internet from there, and uh, I was very harsh with them <laughs> to the point where I got a, a phone call from the CEO uh, because really? I was them online. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> because the th well the thing is they have okay in my defense in that particular case. Uh, you, you buy a SIM card from London Drugs for 20 bucks. Uh, you put money on it, and you use it when you're away. Uh, so coming back from, from the last time I'd used it, it just, was just over a year, so like a year and a, and a month or two. Um, but what I didn't realize was that after 12 months, they cancel the phone number. They, kill your, they basically kill your card. And so I said, well, that's bullshit. What do you mean? But they wouldn't give me an explanation. They didn't tell me what the explanation was. They didn't tell me what their policy was. They didn't tell me all these sorts of things. They eventually just said, well, that's our policy. And I said, well, I think it sucks. I think it's a terrible policy because they have, and, and they had at the time, they may have improved this, I don't know, but on their website, they had one sentence buried within this very small paragraph on one page on their website that made mention of, if you don't use it within 12 months, it will get canceled. Although they didn't actually say that. They said it in this kind of airy-fairy kind of way. And that pissed me off because after yelling loud enough online, the CEO did actually contact me and said, hey, what the hell, man? And I said, well, this is bullshit. <laughs> this is total crap. You have this one thing. If you had a big, huge graphic on your website that said, by the way, morons, if you don't do this, um, because the reason is the FCC in the U.S., where you usually are using this card, have a have a, a burner phone law where any temporary phone numbers, if they're not used in 12 months, they are canceled, and then that phone number is released back into that sort of burner phone pool. <laughs> so yeah, it was I was so mad. I was like, ah, you bastards! And uh, yeah, so uh, but uh, but anyway, so I was so mad. I went to the I went to Disneyland with my family. And while I was down there... You were so I was, mad you went to Disneyland with I your family. I was so mad I went to Disneyland. Fuck you. Ah, Shane, you're so mad. What are you going to do now? <laughs> I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> um, 
So anyway, that was the whole point of me getting this card. So anyway, so they did actually some... I don't know what magic they worked, but they activated my card again. Basically just so I'd shut up. Um, because at the, at, the, at the height of my complaint, I was probably tweeting about it every minute and a half. Um, oh, jeez. So, uh, no wonder they wanted to shut you up. Oh, yeah. Well, I was pissed. And I still, I still stand by what I said. I'm like, I'm sorry, that's not enough. One little tiny thing like this is not enough. And especially when you... And I, here's the other thing, too. I'm like, well, did I miss like it in, when I bought the card? Because I still have the card in its original thing. No mention of that in the card. No mention of it on the packaging. Nothing. So, yeah, I was, I was not happy with that. So, anyway, so uh, what, what happened then is uh, they reactivated my card. And then, of course, I got to Disneyland. And I was just livid about this whole situation. So, I was bitching and moaning about how crappy the signal was. And, ah, fuck them. Ah, they could suck my balls. And uh, <laughs> I'm not proud of that. Uh, but uh, in retrospect... Um, because the thing is, I didn't actually realize, so I contacted, um, was it Verizon, or oh, T-Mobile, uh, T, is that what they're called, T-Mobile in the yeah. States? And I said, dudes, what the hell, man, I, I was at Disneyland trying to get, like, I wasn't trying to, like, stream full HD video or something stupid, but I was just trying to use Twitter. And they said, oh, Disneyland, yeah, that's a problem zone in that, in that area, because we only have so many transmitters, and the amount of people at Disneyland um, overwhelms the system. And I said, oh, okay, well, that makes more sense. So that's not really Rome Mobility's problem. That's a T-Mobile problem. They're like, oh, yeah, no, Rome uses our stuff. Yeah, no, they're fine. So um, they did actually tell me that uh, if I were to go in the spring or in the fall, um, that it probably would be way better. But in the height of summer, they were like, yeah, we were expanding the network, blah, 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 blah. But uh, we haven't done it yet. So so Rome Mobility, if you follow this, uh, maybe I'll tweet this at you. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it, uh, <laughs> but I still the policy thing. No, that 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 was bad. But the quality of signal down there, because then I did use them again last uh, about a month later uh, when I went to Kentucky and sort of drove up the uh, the Highway 61 there, and uh, and I was I did that for about a week and a bit and with a couple of friends of mine, and it was way better. Uh, half the time though, we were way out of. We were not near any populated centers. We were in the middle of nowhere, so uh, the signal wasn't awesome. But in the city, in Nashville, in in uh, uh, Memphis, and all other places like that, it was fine. So, you were in Kentucky. Did you not know that? Is that is that I, the birth is that the birthplace of KFC? Um, I don't know. It could very well be. Although because KFC is Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yeah, but I I wasn't there for the chicken. I was there for the bourbon. So. Oh. If you're gonna go uh, to Kentucky, you have to have the original. Like you got to find the original KFC and and go there. Well, the the problem that I had when dig I dig up there, the Colonel. <laughs> dig up the Colonel. <laughs> Walk me around, alas, poor Colonel. You see um, weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> Party with the colonel. <laughs> the colonel's been laying in state ever since he died, so he's, he's well preserved. Um, anyway, yeah, um, I totally forgot what I was talking about. Oh yeah, so so anyway, uh, to finish off, Roam Mobility is probably the best solution going to the states if you want to use your smartphone because um, it's cheap uh, compared to. Rogers and Fido and all those guys going, we're, of course, going to sell you the cheapest package ever. I'm like, you obviously are not wanting people to know about Rome because they're far better. So um, it's all Dave's fault. I agree. Everything is. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the topic of video games. I don't know how I got talking about stupid stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Have this a bottle wow. opener. Uh, what the hell is that? That's my bottle opener. My He's like the coolest opener. ever. My bottle opener is this. It's not as cool as yours, though. No. This it's is my bottle my, opener. My That's team. just all industrial. and. What is, what is little... that? What are you holding up? What the hell is that, Alan? Is that from That's Star my, Wars? That's my beer bong. <laughs> it's a bottle <laughs> opener. So what you do is you... You you know hold on to the bottle like this and then you you and then the bottle cap gets trapped down. Oh, seriously, 
down in in the thing. That is kind of cool. Seriously. Let's see. Mm, Dave, bottle cap. Dave is unimpressed. Wow. Screw you guys! Man. It's actually even the bottom comes off, so you could take out the bottle cap. See. See, Dave, that's not as cool as your Pillsbury dough opener. There. <laughs> yeah, he is kind of Pillsbury dough guy, isn't he? Is he a, a little bit. frog? Is that a frog? What is that? He looks kind of frog-like, but no. He's very excited he's, about opening bottles. He's Yeah, totally. He's like, woohoo! I think I'm he's opening so cool. beer! <laughs> so let's, uh, and let's and actually, about... that's a good point, because... Cause Last week was the first time he'd actually been used, ever. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Does he have any action down the groin area? What what's going on there? He's uh, he uh, no, he's anatomically bereft. <laughs> bereft. If Good we're music. oh crap, my beer. Oh. If we're making the assumption that this is a male, and I guess we can safely make that assumption because as you can see, the chestal area is similarly bereft. Of anything that might indicate femaleness, area. could just could just be like a, you know, a flat check, <laughs> couldn't it? Uh, sure, could be. Um, be. Be supremely flat. Yeah. Yeah. The prairies. <laughs> yeah. And I think we've lost Shane. Did we lose? <laughs> did he spill his beer? That's like criminal. I'm not sure. Where, where'd you go, Shane? I'm uh, oh. sorry, guys. Bring, what'd you do? Houston, we're bringing Locke into the call. Oh, okay. Uh, he's, he's got a story for us and uh, stuff. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> stories are good. We like stories. Hey, Dave. Do you remember yes, those? Do you remember those little handheld arcade? Games that like right at the height of Pac-Man and Donkey Kong and Frogger and all that. There were days. Uh, they sort of they were in the shape of an arcade unit, but there was like you bought them and you you, you took them home and it's like they were tabletop. I do. I don't remember those, but I do remember seeing ads because I used to subscribe to Computer Gaming World. Because actually no, sorry, I didn't subscribe. I bought them because that was the closest I was going to get to games or consoles, because we didn't have any money. So, um, I right. read those and just drooled over the games and the consoles. Anyways, there was adverts for a console in there that was real similar to what you're talking about. So it was a mini little arcade stand thingy, but it was. Uh, I think, if I remember right, you could get cartridges for it. So, no, it was no, like a self-contained console. Yeah, kind of, but you didn't get cartridges or anything like that. Um, yeah, it was it was kind of fun. It, it, you could get Zaxxon, Pac-Man. Um, you could get uh, Donkey Kong, Frogger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now you can buy those little guys that you just plug into your TV, and they've got like four games on them. Oh yeah, yeah, I got one of those. Uh huh. What has yeah. it got on it? It's got uh, Pac-Man, Dig Dug. Um. Uh, what else? Asteroids. Asteroids. That was one of my faves. Yeah, asteroids. Um, and then a couple others. And then I got this, like, um, it's an Art Atari 2600. It looks like an Atari 2600. Um, but it's a, uh, it's okay. just a unit that you plug into your TV, and it's got the games built into it already. Um, okay. So you just select them. But it's, all the parts are authentic. So the joystick is an authentic Atari 2600 joystick. And apparently, you can go and rewire it so that it will take Atari 2600 cartridges. Oh, I just want to uh, bring to your attention that we've got a new speaker in our podcast uh, today. Um, Locke has arrived, and I, I don't know if he can hear us yet, but hopefully he can. I know that we can't hear him, but you never know. Can you hear me now? Oh, there we go. 
All right. Mm -hmm. hey, Kick ass. We have Hello. Lockhart Fulton on the line from Washington, D.C. Tell us what is breaking in Washington. <laughs> not much breaking in Washington. Um, yeah, so so I was just out to pick up some beer uh, to do this thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I got um, uh, an Innocent Gun Toasted Oak IPA to try out. Never tried this one before. I, I, I nice. think it was the regular Innocent Gun. Nice. I like the Innocent Gun because it was it was always a. Uh, it's kind of a. It has to me. It tastes like honey. Some of them, because uh, they have that honey brown. I think, and it really does taste like honey. I still remember Shane going into the shop that you normally hit on Main there, and the guy telling us that one of his faves was that Innocent Gun rum finished. Mm. Which I have yet to try. Um, I, I still want to try that one. I totally want to have it again. So, uh, Locke, uh, the topic for the day um, has been old video games that you played growing up. And I know that you have an incredibly... At least I picture it as being probably one of your favorite games uh, growing up. So, uh, what is your favorite video game? Um, I have this funny feeling we're talking about one of two. Probably Questron is the one we're, we're That's referring the one to. That's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah. The, the one other one that I, I think is a, a worthy mention there would be uh, Dungeons of Daggerath. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, my God. I, I totally yeah. forgot about that game. Because I, I, I actually, it's kind of funny you mentioned it because I downloaded the PC port for it a little while ago and I was playing it the other night. And, uh, has anybody here played Dungeons of Daggerath other than me and Locke? No, never heard of it. Um, Dungeons of Daggerath was a game from, I think, 82-ish? Yeah, that sounds about right. And Holy. it was a very basic... It was a dungeon-crawling game. Essentially, you were a character, and you were in a dungeon, and you had to pick up uh, torches for a lighting source. Uh, you had to find... Um, you know, beer, beer. <laughs> Sorry, I had to find swords. I said beer, I meant swords. Um, as well as, um, you know, shields and magic rings and potions and all kinds of things. And of course, there were creatures. There were spiders, snakes, large sort of creature golem things, uh, mystical knights and whatnot. And it was a 3D game, much like the Star Wars games um, and that kind of stuff. So it had that sort of vector feel to it. But it had the, the one component that it had was that it was written in BASIC, and oh. it had very good sound design for a game of that age, uh, yeah. where you had the creatures that made noise, um, and the heart. Your heart was this little icon in the middle of the screen, and depending on how you moved, whether you were swinging a sword or swinging a, uh, your shield or taking a, a swig of something, um, your heart would speed up to the point where basically your heart would explode because you were so incredibly involved in what was going on. And, uh, yeah, it was kind of cool. It was it was a really great game. It, it only had, um, was it four or five levels? I, can't, I think it was four levels. Um, yeah, something like that. And uh, did you ever finish the game, Locke? Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, which I did. I did that a couple times, and I remember uh, having to, to. I remember rushing home one day from school, probably grade six, seven, somewhere in there, yeah. and uh, and actually going, oh my god, I gotta, I gotta get home. I've got I, I have to finish because I'm so close to the end. And I, uh, at the time, had those tape decks, uh, you know, where you save data to a to a basically a cassette mm. tape, yeah. and. I was so frustrated because it was so slow. I'm like, oh, come on, come on, load the game! God damn it, I just died! I gotta get back in there! <laughs> oh, it was so amazing. And wow. uh, the best part is that if you play the PC port, which I think is actually cross-platform, you might be able to play it on your Mac, um, is if, if somebody has gone and created additional sounds, so like a realistic heartbeat and all kinds of crap, I, I still play with the original. But yeah. um, you still have to save the same way. You have to like go into the thing, the command window, and go Z save, and then give it a name. 
and uh, yeah, it was kind of it was so it was so neat that Z load in the name, and you have to remember the name was. Yeah, I I had forgotten about that game. That was a brilliant game, uh, and I remember reading about it years and years later about how they actually created it, um, because they had to make it so that it worked on a cassette. Um, they had to make it like a, sorry a cartridge because I had it originally as a cartridge. Yeah. And uh, then of course they ported it to a couple of other things, uh, video game systems that I'd never heard of. Uh, but yeah, it, it, I. <laughs> Sorry, I'm I, I'm so glad you brought that one up. Yeah, well, I, like I remember when when I first figured out how to get those rings to work because it, it had been a, an utter mystery to me. Now I don't know how much of this was down to the fact that at the time we were what like you know somewhere between eight and ten or something like that. Yeah. So that might have been a contributing factor, but but I was so chuffed when I when I I, I finally. Figured it out. The, the Vulcan ring is actually a fire ring, and when I called it a fire ring, all of a sudden I could use it to attack the demons, and oh, it, was, it was amazing. That's kind of thinking that I was <sighs> And the commands, too. I remember the first time uh, trying to figure out what the commands were for a variety of those games, and I remember actually going down to the Radio Shack and going, I don't know how to make the Vulcan ring, or whatever the ring was at the time. And they actually, they actually printed off on a dot matrix printer like a list of commands and things. Like a list of all the... <laughs> I gotta say, oh, I'm so wow. sad that Radio Shack tanked uh, recently because uh, you know it was uh, it's too bad. Well, that's in the states. We haven't had Radio Shack here in Canada in years. Yeah, details, details. I just knew <laughs> in the back of my mind it was still around somewhere. Um, and yeah, so sure enough, you can actually if you go to uh, M. MS or sorry mspencer.net forward slash Daggerath, you'll find the uh, the PC port uh, last uh. updated in uh, 2009, um, mm. and it took him since 2002 to actually port it. So he, uh, you know, they did all kinds of stuff uh, to get it running, um, uh. and they also made they ported it to Linux as well. I I seem to remember. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, Linux port of version 3.1. Yeah, there we go. So you could actually use that to play it on your uh, your Mac. So, uh, tell tell uh, now. I know that Dave and and Alan do not know what Questron is. Um, oh, tell right. us all about Questron because I was always amazed at that game, and I wish it would get ported, but it hasn't. Yeah, like so. Basically, a sort of a um, a map scroller. Uh, fairly primitive, you know. By today's standards, but but at the time it was you know it was quite exciting you know you move you know a, a block over and then a block over and then a block over and you're seeing different types of um, types of you know uh, wilderness like it you might be in grasslands or you might be in forest or you might be in mountains and depending on whether you're in grasslands or forest or mountains you'd get different kinds of beasties that had a random chance of popping up and attacking you. At which point you go into a sort of a melee cycle where you, you know, uh, you hit them, they hit you, you hit them, they hit you, and, you know, eventually one of them, hopefully them, dies. Um, and, uh, you know, and then you might find some gold or something like that on, on account of having defeated them. And then, you know, you sort of roam around the countryside like that. Um, and then eventually you start running into towns, and then the towns, there the map gets a little bit larger, so you, you, it scales up, so now, you, now you've got, uh, you can sort of see individual villagers and shops and stuff, and you can go around to casinos, and uh, I mean, the depth, given the, the level of, of um, technology at the time, was, was something else, like somebody had really just taken, you know, sort of the basic imagination tools of, 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 you know, maps and, and being able to move back and forth and, and, you know, have sort of little interactions with, with uh, sort of uh, text-based characters or whatever. They, they, they took that about as far as you could take it. Like, like so two whole continents, uh, and by the time you get to the second continent, evidently, They'd spent a long time working on it because in the first continent there was absolutely no 3D perspective graphics at all. It was all just flat. 
But when you get to the 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 next continent, all of a sudden, now when you go into certain types of dungeon, now you've got sort of like Dungeons of Daggerath type, you know, sort of first person shooter kind of kind of graphics, though not very smoothly animated or anything like that. Um, and to get, I mean, to get to the second continent, uh, you got to go through a, a, a whole lot of drama, in, including uh, uh, going to the palace where you're trying to be friends with the king, but at the same time you're trying also trying to rob his treasure chests to take uh, a, a different sets of keys so that you can eventually get whatever it is you need to get to the next continent. I mean, it's. <laughs> I, mean, I, I could blather on without making a lot of sense for probably a full another hour because that's exactly what we did for hours and hours and hours of our youth. Is that not right, Shane? Oh God, yeah. I remember going to your house, God, probably around what I guess grade five, was it somewhere in there. I, I was somewhere mm-hmm. in there, and uh, and that's actually what's kind of funny is that uh, as adults. Uh, we still have done the same thing where there's been video games that I've had in like my my PlayStation and whatnot that you've played and I've just watched. Like I just I have this <laughs> thing about watching people playing video games where I enjoy them playing them myself, but then I still get pleasure out of watching other people play them because uh, strategies are different. People play different styles and things like that, and it's always fascinating to me. And I remember back then. I mean, I think I rarely ever actually played the Quest Run game. I just watched you play it because you were so involved in it. Like it was, it was such an immersive kind of thing that you role played it at your computer desktop, and it was kind of fun. Which I don't think you see that much anymore. I mean, I mean unless you really, really get involved in things like Skyrim and all these sorts of big games. But um, it's still. What, what platform was this on? This was on the Apple II C. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. it, was, it was available on the Commodore 64, the Apple II, and I think something else. Actually, I could Google it, but I remember it being definitely playable on Commodore 64 because yeah, yeah. Uh, I was trying to get a copy of it for somebody else hmm. um, at the time. But um, Questron 2 came out, and it was on the PC. Um, but I remember playing it and kind of thinking it sucked. So it didn't have the same sort of life that the other one did. Right. Um, actually, I remember playing with Angus once on Questron 2. Uh, I connected my computer to um, the the living room television kind of thing. And, and did that one. But, um, yeah, Questron. Gotta love it. Wow. Okay, so did anyone else play Ultima? No, actually, I didn't. I, now, Ultima was Questron-ish is, is, is sort of my recollection, but I, I, for whatever reason, I think probably because I'd already spent enough time playing Cluster on it, I didn't feel like I could <laughs> dedicate that amount of computer time to playing uh, Ultima as well. But, uh, but I, that I turned wonder. into a series, actually. Yeah. I was, uh, what, five, I think, five iterations of that one. Ultima huh. had, like, Ultima 10 was sort of the last one kind of thing. Oh wow! Okay, I stopped playing much before then, but uh, that was one of my favorites. <laughs> it had it went up to Ultima Nine or no, Ultima Eight, no Ultima Nine, and then sorry, I'm, they've got a confusing map here, and then Ultima, the Lord of Ultima, Ultima Forever, and Ultima Online, massive multiplayer. Um, Ultimate Online was a massive multiplayer that ran from 1997 to 2004, looks like. Wow. And then... Probably got uh, absolutely buried by WoW. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the and then Lord of Ultima was another one that started in 2010, but it was shut down just last year. So... Mm. Did you guys ever play the original Castle Wolfenstein? Yes. Yeah, isn't I, that I, a great game? I just played that. I, I was. I. It's funny you mentioned. Seriously. I, played, I played that on arch, um, archive.org. Uh, has a video game uh, section, and 
uh, called the Internet Arcade, and that is one of the games that's in their collection. And uh, it's so kind just of... so ever, just so everybody realizes this, we're not talking about the Wolfenstein 3D that was very popular yeah. in in yeah, the 90s. Yeah. We're talking about the original two-dimensional one. Uh, where you saw the overhead map of the room, and you went in, and there were soldiers, and SS would suddenly come in, but they would they would shout SS as they're coming in, and you'd have a heart attack and uh, try to get out of the room. And yeah, yeah. Oh god, I love that game too. It's funny because um, archive the archive.org thing they they actually have some sort of deal with the original publishers. Um, because a lot of these games, you can't really play them because there's really no systems that exist anymore to really play them on. So they've basically emulated a lot of these. Like they go from um, arcade ones, like things you'd see in the arcade, like um, a Ghouls and Ghosts, or uh, what's, the, what's the one I tried playing the other day? It didn't work very well. Um, uh, Minor 49er, or no, Bagman, Bagman, Super Bagman. Oh, yeah. And it didn't work very well. It kind of sucked. And I loved that game. I remember playing it in the arcade as well. It was amazing. But, I vaguely uh, remember Minor 49er. Refresh my forgettery. I think Minor 40. I think Super Bagman was actually a sequel to Minor 49er. Like Minor 49er had a bit of different. It had different gameplay, but I think it was supposed to be a, a sequel to it. Um, there was also like stuff like Super Hang On. Um, uh, Golden Tee Golf, like the original Golden Tee from way back when. Um, there was also uh, Zaxxon, I think, stuff like that. Oh, Zaxxon yeah. I loved. I remember playing that actually on the ColecoVision. Uh, a friend of mine growing up had a ColecoVision, and we played it. And then he got bored of his ColecoVision and pl- unplugged it because he, he got a, a Super NES or whatever, whatever it was called at the time, the first sort of Nintendo entertainment system. And then he, uh, so I took his ColecoVision to my place, and at the time I had a TV in my bedroom, and I just played all those games for hours. There were a whole bunch that were really decent. Um, yeah. Oh, God, man. I'm you were playing B-52. B-52. Oh, I did it on the Intellivision. B-52 Bomber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, the, the, the the voice the Intella voice is is, is the, the bomber one and it was mm. patchy at best at creating a human voice but <laughs> bomber oh, oh yeah it was brutal because I mean the Intellivision was was uh, one of those systems that never really made it it, it, it had a bunch of things but um, it just had it, I mean it was so there's a whole bunch of if you want to hear about the history of, of video game uh, consoles there's a really great uh, documentary about it, which I can't remember the name of, but if you actually watch the Angry Video Game Nerd uh, <laughs> on YouTube, um, he actually has a really great selection of, of different consoles, and he actually gives you basically a history lesson of different games that were played on different consoles, and, and it's actually kind of fun to see really old stuff you would never, ever, ever hear about, um, because the game consoles didn't survive. They, they were put out and they lasted maybe a year or two but it was it was during that sort of phase of you know the Atari 2600 Atari 4800 that kind of stuff um, in there and then as soon as the Super Nintendo system showed up uh, that basically kicked everyone's ass um, and you know then, then of course you saw the Sega Genesis show up stuff like that because they were trying to copy what Nintendo yeah. was doing and uh you know, basically threw out every other idea that had ever been created. The Intellivision, unfortunately, was one of those ones that just did not really do it and didn't really survive because. But, but you know what's um, you know what's funny? So many of of the biggest hits on the market right now in terms of gaming. If you really dig down, you really analyze what's going on there. You're looking at at gaming principles that that were defined like really early on. Like, did you ever play Utopia on, on the Intellivision? No, I never did. I so, never heard you about it. You got, like, an island and, you know, like, rain clouds will, you know, show up sometimes and sometimes not. If they do and they hit your crops that you set up, they'll they'll make the crops pay out rewards. Um, then you'll have other things like hurricanes will show up and destroy stuff. And But basically, it's sort of like, it's sort of like SimCity was, only... 
much simpler graphics, right? Right, right. Actually, if you take that forward, Minecraft is kind of like Utopia crossed with Questron, in a way. Weird. You know, it's got another dimension to play with now, but 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 that whole business of, of weather patterns and 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 you know growing crops and and exploring worlds that you know the, that whole paradigm like different you know grasslands is is indicated by it's a grassland square you know I mean that that principle was was set out really early on with Utopia and Quest Run and you look at something like. Uh, scorched Earth. Do you remember Scorched Earth? Yeah, I mean, actually, that was, I think that was probably my, my program. Probably most of us have programmed a really simple version of that game in Basic, right? Like it's it's a guess a number game where you guess the right amount of gunpowder and the right amount of you know uh, angle or whatever, and you either hit the target or you don't, right? But <clears throat> where where uh, Scorched Earth took that next was okay. We're, now, not only can you see the little pew, and either you hit it or you don't, now you can use different types of ordnance where you can blow up, you know, big chunks of, of the landscape, which is hilarious, right? That, well, that's, actually, that's what I was talking about earlier before you came on. That was actually my choice for top video games because uh, when you played it, you, you could play it online or the rudimentary online back then with by dialing at people's modems. But you could, but playing with actually a bunch of people, uh, yeah. hanging out in the same it room, was it was always fun. Social games, like turn-based yeah. social party games. And I, I was, sure. we, we talked at length about the death's head, <laughs> the yeah. death's head weapon that always uh, ended, you know, the round usually. Ninety-nine percent of the time. Tell me, tell me, Angry Birds isn't really just this generation's extrapolation of that same principle. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, yeah, maybe. I guess. Well, kind of, I mean, it's different. Yes, but I mean, it's the same sort of idea. Levels of complexity. Yeah, the physics are better. The you know, it's more interactive. But, but the principle. Pew, boom. Yeah. But that but game. But it lacks that social. Thing. Yeah, it lacks yeah, that social it Totally lacks the social element. Now, if there was, if there was, um, uh, a turn-based. Angry Birds, where different players get a, get a crack at it, and that would be that would be a, a. Should should we just build it, or should should we let? I think, uh, I think we should. I think we got a winner here. We let Robio know about that one. I I don't know. I, to me, that's a that's a seller. We could make like a Crafty Boys game, and it's, instead of using like Angry Birds, we can use Angry Crafty Boys. This beer sucks. I got a question for you. This is a real question. This is a technical issue. Um, yeah. Can you see me right now? No. No. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna disconnect and reconnect and see if I can fix that because I want I want to show you the label on the beer that I'm drinking now. I'm now drinking cool. arrogant bastard ale. Oh, nice. All right, oh, come on. Okay. Okay, hold on. I'll be I'll be back in a sec. He'll be back in a sec. I thought he'd never leave. <laughs> No, that's awesome. That uh, I'm glad Locke's here because Locke, that's that's right. Because uh, before I knew Alan, Locke was was somebody I hung out with and played video games with a lot. And uh, Questron was amazing uh, because it it was like a top down thing. You were traveling kind of you know through the wilderness and going to towns and whatnot, like he was describing. Um, but when you found yourself in a like a, a dungeon. It became a 3D game. Like suddenly you were in a 3D environment, very similar to Dungeons and Daggerath or, you know, stuff of that era. Hmm. And I always remember being just so mesmerized, like, wow, look the monsters. You can see it far off. It's walking towards you, and oh my god, what's he gonna do? And and I remember Locke sort of having these formulaic sort of things or or formulas for, I'm gonna you know use this particular uh, spell on this creature, and and then I'm gonna kick its ass with my sword and. You know stuff like that. It was amazing. I was I was always blown away, and it maybe wanted to get like an Apple II C back then, uh, but I was already committed to the PC world. So, can you do? Um, the Apple II C sucked. Did you have it? Did were you an Apple kid way back then? Well, I mean, my school, the the first 
computer lab they had was was an Apple lab. So that we played back like when apples were the what, shit. What was that one? Was the uh, the wagon train or something? And you're 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 going across Canada and you're Oregon Trail. Yeah, Oregon Trail. Thank you. And um, so I guess it wasn't really going across Canada. They still make that, you know. Do they? I, I actually no way. Bought, I bought it a couple of years ago. Still not fucking doing it, is it? Bought it? Uh, did you? Uh, you are still you must, invisible. If you hover your your mouse over top of the the hangout window, yeah. you should see this little menu pop up. What does it say at the top? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So so I've got camera and microphone slashed out. Which is to say, well, if they're both white, yeah. then they should be operating. Um, if they're, they're red, white, they're muted. Or you yeah, know, the slash is there just to indicate that if you click on it, you can actually mute them or turn them off. Um, okay. Click on, click on the, uh, click on the, uh, the camera, and then try and click on it again. It might trigger something to tell you, like, hey, are you going to grant access to your camera or something? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if you need to go into your settings lock and oh, hold on, hold on, set the camera. Let me, let me see if this does it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best podcast episode ever. Damn straight. <laughs> That's because we're men and we're awesome. <laughs> um, if you have instructions, throw them out. Let's see if this will do it. <laughs> Click. Um, Ultima. You were Never played Ultima. it. Never uh, played it. That was one of my faves. I'm trying. I I'm still trying to remember that other game. Other stuff happened in Ultima because there was so many, there's so many iterations of it. I was so surprised just finding it on the on the Wikipedia and like, wow, really? There's like five thousand. Oh, it was huge, man! Absolutely huge. I mean, you got this uh, really cool cloth map in the box for the world of Ultima. It um, looks like it's a dead system now, or a dead uh, franchise. It uh, it had its it had its time, and uh, although I I understand that uh, there's something called Ultima Lazarus, which apparently um, oh, Lockhart's here. Seems oh, rather fit. With his face? Yay! Thing work. That was really funny, Locke, because you said, well, let's see if this does it, and then you hung up. And you were yeah, going on. Apparently, apparently what that does is crash the program. Oh, nice. <laughs> so uh, show us the beer label. Okay, so ch check this motherfucker out. Arrogant Bastard Ale. That's the one that we were going to look for a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we couldn't find it anywhere. Well, it's out on the shelves again. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, i got to tell you, I mean, it's it's one of those things where confidence doesn't necessarily go along with confidence. Um, it's good. It's, it's beer. It's drinkable. It's boozy. It's not necessarily great. <laughs> it's beer. It's drinkable. But you got to like somebody that prints... You're not worthy on the front of their fucking label. You're not worthy fuck. of this beer. You suck. You're the fucking demon. <laughs> That's awesome. So tell us about the beer. like. Yeah, we should talk about the beer again because uh, yeah. I – did you guys so, run out? I've, I've still got some going here. So, so what yeah, I can I tell you is this, um, this here Innocent Gun uh, IPA is sparklingly average. Um <laughs> <laughs> That's a glowing review. Yeah, no. Like, it's not an IPA, and it's not as good as regular Innocent Gun, which, like like Shane said, has this kind of weird sort of oaky vanilla thing going on. It's, uh, you know. The, so, yeah, this this is sort of, this defeats the purpose. So, um, <laughs> that's probably why it was marked down by an extra 40 cents. Now, what I didn't buy while I was down there was the... Deschutes uh, Black Boot Special Edition uh, $20 ale. And the reason I didn't buy it is because it's 20 bucks and not <laughs> beer. Um, my thought, given the way that those things are flying off the shelves, is that I'm going to wait. 
those things are coming down. <laughs> no question about that. <laughs> They're there and they don't move. There's dust on the bottles. <laughs> You know, the, 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 on the bottle it says these things age well. Well, they better. <laughs> <laughs> well, they better. <laughs> Actually, I was um, I was when I was in Victoria last weekend, uh, a week and a half ago, um, for fu- a dual funeral experience. Um, I did happen to uh, hang out with some uh, some family members I hadn't seen in a long time, and. One of them has actually taken a bedroom in their house and they have uh, turned it into a wine cellar. Uh, so, like, it's environmentally controlled all on its own. Like, he's got, like, the whole environmental thing set up. There's, like, a, a an air conditioner at the, at the above the door, through the wall kind of thing. Um, he's got a lock on the door uh, because he's got some bottles of wine... Uh, that are like six or seven thousand dollars a piece, kind of thing. What? Wow. Um, but the thing I found interesting was when you know, because I normally buy like you know the eight ten dollar bottle of wine here and there. Um, but I've never seen this before. On the really expensive bottles of wine, they all have written on their labels of when they're actually ready to be consumed, and the bulk of them. The earliest one that I read was uh, 2022. But it's not just that year. It's actually a range of 2022 to like 2040 kind of thing. They actually have a range of when that wine supposedly is going to be drinkable at its peak, you know? And they give you a range based... And and the range... uh, is indicated also by what conditions the bottle is kept in. So if it's, uh, you know, kept in a shelf somewhere where there's sunlight nearby, you know, it's going to be ready uh, earlier. If it's kept in a proper uh, cellar, it'll be ready later, and it'll be, con- you know, and if it's controlled, in theory, it'll be better. So I was kind of interested. I've actually never seen that for beer. Um, you know, where you see like, this beer is awesome, but drink it, you know, ten years from now, drink it now, kind of thing. Um, well, you won't find that with beer because beer, especially craft brews that are, you know, don't have preservatives in them and stuff like that, um, you got to drink them within, you know, probably six months at most. Yeah, I mean, that's especially for like growlers and stuff. Oh, hey, Locke, um, I was mentioning to uh, the boys here as we started uh, earlier, or when we started, that um, I might have a. Uh, an allergy to yeast because that beer uh, now it might have been just the beer but I am going to an allergist uh, next week but um, every so often I'll have I'll have a beer but I'll have you know like a you know say an average of say maybe about that much so not even quite half a glass uh, of beer and but I'll wake up the following morning feeling like I had drank a whole bunch and I've noticed this for the past six months, year or so, that if I do that, that I'll, you know, feel really awful the next day, even though I've barely had any. Um, so that beer you and I had on Friday, that, you know, glass of beer that we had, that we shared, um, f- f- of that, uh, the yellow beer, the stuff that we had. Anyway, um, I felt <laughs> awful. Beer? I felt awful on Monday morning. I felt really bad, like I had had way too much. So I called the the GP guy that I have, and I'm like, yeah. So this is the thing that you know I'm having. I you know have I do this, and then I feel like I've had five times as much. And he said, oh well, the craft brewery is in town. Sorry. That yellow beer was a Belgian, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. So I have to. St- so he said that potentially that with all the craft breweries that are on, um, with them experimenting with different. Recipes, not quite refining them as as you, you know, they're not a fifty thousand year old beer. It's a beer that's relatively new. That they are not potentially processing them properly, and the yeast is not entirely fermented out of the beer. And uh, because apparently, people can have allergies to all kinds of things, obviously, but the uh, yeast is apparently potent, especially potent uh, to people sensitive to it. So. 
So yeah, isn't that awesome? <laughs> well, that that rules a few drinks out. So um, one of the things that uh, Spinnaker's tried uh, uh, early in the game. This was this was I don't know some, something like '86 or something like that. They tried working with wild yeasts just for the hell of it. Right. And did it was it? I'm assuming um, it was not successful. Well, it was it was an interesting experiment, and I, I think Paul Hadfield's own words were something like, uh, "It had the most unbelievable gorgonzola nose to it." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I, I think I think that particular round didn't work. Now they I think they tried it again more successfully with the with the King Tut exhibit. They maybe tried it again then. I, I I can't remember for sure what the what the results were like there, mm. but um, but yeah, I mean that's I mean it used to be all wild yeast. That's that's the in fact probably the Egyptians. I I would be surprised if they had a word for yeast. This was just part of the magic that happened when you leave big barrels of you know wheat water out in the fucking in the desert or whatever. It wasn't desert back then. No, no, at least okay, not, not, back, not back in the old king times. Uh, ge geolog geologists agree it's uh, it, it was mighty rainy there at one point in history. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, does that mean that we should be imagining the pyramids being built with you know uh, grasslands surrounding? Probably not. I don't know. Hard to say though. The Sphinx apparently was was around at a time when it was when it was rainy and humid. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Hey, let's see the Crafty Boys teaching you history, right here. Now, let, 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 let the Crafty Boys here teach you another lesson. So, on my way to get said beer here, um, I'm driving down an alley on the way to the liquor store. And I see a guy who fits exactly the description. In fact, he looks exactly like the guy who I saw in the security footage of a son of a bitch that broke into my fucking Jeep. What? Yeah. And what was he doing? He was casually wandering around in an alley looking at uh, an automatic garage door to an apartment building. So I stopped, and I, I kind of watched him for a minute, and then another car pulls up behind me. So I pull into a parking space, get out of the vehicle, and I walk out, and I'm like, hey, buddy, you looking for something? <laughs> well, he just keeps casually walking along down the alley like he doesn't hear me. Now, I shouted pretty loud. I kind of thought he heard me. And so my thought was, you know, he probably heard me. Why is he walking so slow? He's not. He's not going to talk to me. Why is he not going to talk to me? Is that the guy? Is that? Am I seeing things? Is that really the guy? Now, now, just pause there for a second, nothing, just to give. There's nothing, there's nothing really to, to fucking fix it. So I can't just walk <laughs> and fucking help him, right? I mean, he's walking away calmly. If I go up and attack him, then then I'm the bad guy. So I'm. I'm standing there just looking at this in disbelief, like, <laughs> I bet that's the guy, but I, I, I mean, I can't do shit. If I call it, <laughs> well, there's this guy, he's a baseball cap and a hoodie. Yeah, no, I don't know if I really got a good look at his face. Yeah, well, he's, but he looks like the guy on the security. Yeah, well, he was wearing a baseball cap and a hoodie, too. Um, <laughs> at uh, one to, point, to, to, well, to he's give about Dave. the height. You know, like, I mean... Yeah. But he was fucking checking out a, a garage door, and I'm thinking, like, you don't have a car. What are you looking at fucking garage doors for? To oh. give uh, Locke, or to give uh, Dave and, and Alan and anyone who watches this context, um, was what, two, what, November, October, somewhere in there? Uh, yeah, may, have, some... may have been earlier in the year, but essentially, uh, Locke. Uh, Somebody broke into their their underground parking, and ruffled you know rummaged through uh, his car, um, but in the in the process left the crowbar behind, 
Um, so. Oh my God, do I ever wish I had that crowbar with me tonight? Because how ironic would be if they get jumped and get beaten with a crowbar that you left this. Anyway. But no, um, but yeah, the head of the head of the head is you go up to him and say, "Did you? Did, is this yours? Did is this you yours? This? Oh yeah, this is totally mine. Okay, here you go." But um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, that's that's uh, that's. Don't ever piss Lock off when you touch when you touch his vehicle. Clearly, <laughs> holy we fucking shit. Touch out. I thought he was going to reach through the monitor and, like, strangle me. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. No, but it's every right to be, because that, if, you know, because that's not, that, I mean, we had that problem a couple times in our building here where we've had just people wandering through. Um, and, you know, most of them are probably just people lost because they're looking for somebody's apartment. But uh, there was one time where I got up really early in the morning because I had to be somewhere, and it was about 4.30 or so, and I started walking down the stairwell, and I I suddenly heard like hushed talking, and then one uh, then a door closed, um, and I had actually interrupted somebody who was or uh, two people, uh, in one of our stairwells who were trying to, uh, they had already popped one of the pins on the door, so they were trying to pop the pin on the other hinge, so they were trying to do that. So I ran out to the ex the exterior door. And saw these two guys running off down the street, um, but uh, they had actually managed somehow at some point had put cardboard over the interior part of like the latch on the exterior door. So I took that off and closed the door properly. But it happens a lot in in, in this town. I mean, even Vancouver, you know, this kind of stuff happens. When cities get big enough. You have that kind of element, which kind of sucks. But all I can really do is. Uh, you know, walk around with a pair of pliers and a blowtorch, and hopefully you'll catch somebody. <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome to the big smoke. Um, Makes me glad I live up here. Yeah, I mean, the nearest criminal around there is... Uh, Otis. Actually, the I don't think I have any... Camel River doesn't have uh, criminals, I understand. Um, oh, no, it does. Oh, sorry, Black Black Creek, sorry. Not, not, not Camel River, Black Creek. Uh, which is, you know, basically in the middle of nowhere. It's kind of like... It's a bedroom Port community. <laughs> it's a bedroom community of Campbell River. Campbell River is like this <laughs> and major metro metropolis. <laughs> With its own superheroes and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, uh, we've been going for quite a while. Any final words before we shut this episode down? Well, let's uh, have a go around with uh, what our thoughts on the longboat. Um, I like it. It's got chocolate in it, and that makes me happy. <laughs> and it's also a porter, which makes me even happier. So um, I give a humongous thumbs up to the Phillips Long Boat Chocolate Porter. Which may be Shane's last beer yeah, ever. Maybe my last beer if I'm allergic to yeast, my God. Um, what about you, D Dave, who's gone? Dave? Dave? Hey. I'm here. I don't know what happened today. Oh, there he is. So, what about you, Dave? What's your, uh, your read on this beer? Well, I um, personally, I give it a big thumbs up for the label. The, the label's pretty epic too. I have to. Agree. I, I I like the label. It's impressive. Um, actually, didn't mind it. I thought it was pretty tasty, and it was pretty amazing how how much chocolatiness there was in that beer. Yeah, it's very similar to the uh, the Fuggle, the Fuggles and Warlock one, which is mm. something that you for their for their coffee bean one, you'd think it would be overpowering that there would be something, you know, oh my God, that doesn't really go in beer. Why are they even bothering? But they managed. They got a good balance going on where it's it mm. tastes like coffee, it tastes like beer, but it's not. It doesn't clash. And I'm and I, I got to say the Longboat uh, Chocolate Porter, um, is kind of like that. And which, by the way, I give a shout out to the um, Dunkel. Uh, the orange, ch the chocolate orange one, uh, which I think is done by Island, by, or Vancouver Island Brewery, I think, or is really? it Phillips as well? I can't remember. Mm. Um, whoever makes the Dunkel, I give a shout out to that because that's again like eating one of those chocolate oranges or drinking one of those chocolate oranges without it tasting gross. Um, Locke, I of course have had uh, arrogant bastard ale a few times. Um, yeah. I give it a thumbs up as well. What about uh, that? Was that and so, so 
my final offering for this evening, uh, this is Fernie Brewing. Now, Fernie Brewing is mostly known for a product called What's the Huck, or What the Huck, that's it. It's a huckleberry beer, and I've got to say it's it's a, uh, a very tasty beverage. I've had lots of them. Um, uh, it's my go-to when I'm, when I'm in the interior. Uh, but they made a product, which I, I, I want to make it clear that this is... There's nothing racist about the name. It's called an India Brown Ale, and Hot Saw India Brown Ale is the full name. The it's got a lager. Saw? Hot Saw. And it's oh, got okay. a lager with a big bloody saw getting ready to, to carve you a new one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Got his saw ready to go. It's, it, where's he holding his saw? Like in the appropriate place, you would say, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it kind of looks I mean, like he's playing the guitar or uh, making a statement. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, uh, it's uh, what can I tell you? The first taste there was a maybe like a hint of like marmite or something, but which was a, <laughs> a, 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 Wow! Wow! Um, but, <laughs> and it works. It has the most pungent characteristics of 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 uh, a Scots wee heavy and an IPA. And <laughs> that's awesome. If you look at that that bastard right there, you can nice. see why. <laughs> Well, on uh, on that note, uh, we will say good night because this is quite the long episode. If you've got all the way here, thank you again for listening. Um, uh, Alan, where can people find you online? I believe it's Twitter. Twitter at Alan M. Ford. At Alan M. Ford. So, you know, the at thing. It's like the swirly, <clears throat> you know, email-y thing. At... <laughs> And then Alan, A L A N, and then an M, and then Ford, you know, like the car. And that's. that's Longest like, Twitter yeah. name handle expla explanation ever. <laughs> Dave, I know that you have no online presence really whatsoever. Not uh, really, no. Point get one. You where I suppose I, I should yeah, do you something should get at least about Twitter, that. Man. Even if you don't use it all that often, at least people could find you. And well, Locke, you I know you use Twitter to... now. You're brand new to Twitter, Locke. What, uh, what's your handle? Um, I'm, I'm twitting like a maniac, and it's... Uh, You're twatting? Twatting. I'm twatting like a maniac. Yeah. And, and I will keep twatting as long as the twats come my way. <laughs> um, the... Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> God, nothing. Uh, Locky Fulton, I think, is where I'm at. That totally works. Um, <laughs> and of course, I am Shane, and I. You can find I'm me. Not Shane. Usually defensive as this. <laughs> uh, I'm Shane B. Uh, Shane B. W. E. And uh, on the Twitters, and uh, of course, Google me, and you'll find me everywhere. Um, thank you again for everyone listening, slash viewing, slash all one of you. Uh, we don't do this to really entertain people. We do this to entertain ourselves. We're doing it for fun. And uh, I'm glad Locke showed up. And uh, I certainly hope you come back next week, sir. And uh, I'm going to be in, in London, England. So, oh, so oh crap, that's right, you're leaving. I but no, no, send me the thing anyway, because because it's not clear to me that it costs anything to do these Google Hangouts. Is it, it, no, no, it's it, totally it, free. So if you have internet connectivity and uh, you... you if I've got internet connectivity, then we can do this. Yeah. All right. Well, let's set that up, man. Timing could be an issue. <laughs> yes, timing could be an issue. It'll be uh, what, it's three in the morning. <laughs> you're 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 not you're not accounting for my jet lag. No, yeah, this is a good point. That's this is a good point. Whereabouts are you going to be in in the UK when you're there? Are you, are you heading um, straight to Oxford or? I mean, next Wednesday I'll be in London. The one the Wednesday after that might be in Oxford. Uh, well, right now uh, it's seven a.m. in uh, England. Uh, or sorry, in London specifically, uh, which I think they all are only one time zone, aren't they? So um, it would be so, about uh, f 4 a.m., 5, no, uh, 5 well, a.m. Locker, uh, locker, locker can have coffee while we That's drink true. beer. 
That's we, right. can have, we can have coffee beer, and he can just have coffee. Oh, it is England. They <laughs> might actually have coffee. I'm frequent of in England. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So again, thank you guys for watching, listening, uh, hanging out. And uh, if you uh, want us, if you have any suggestions for beer that we should be having, then uh, by all means, let us know, and uh, and we'll drink it because that's what we do. Thank you again from the Crafty Boys. Thank you. Bye. See you next time.